Can you hear me? Yeah. This one, yeah. Okay, I thought Twitter was dead, but uh, good to know that everybody's still using it. Uh, yes, I have some disclosures. Work for Atrax and Biomet, conducting two RCTs. And this is an important slide for this lecture. We will discuss a lot about history. Does anybody know which team is this? Qatar. Okay, quite good, yeah. Which team? Which year? 92? 78? Okay, th I think you all have to stay within 30 minutes. I'll give you the answer. And I'm going to discuss about hamstring injuries. And what you will see, there's a lot of data here from Espeta, but we all have to recognize that all the work starts at the clubs. So all the credits for the NSMP. And I think the big mistake we made over the last years was that we didn't get them much involved in research. And hopefully from now we're going to change it a little bit. So Dr. Slim is already in our ankle study. And hopefully you also can contribute in the future on our hamstring studies. So this is the experience at Espital. We have to be aware that in 2009 we already started here. I was not here. Cristiano was the only sports medicine physician who was here. They started already a consensus meeting on hamstring injuries. And when was 2009? <coughs> AMAT looked like this. <laughs> so there had been a lot of changes over the years. Especially up till two years ago, we saw 250 muscle injuries each year. And that makes Espera really unique in the world. And out of these 250 at the OPD, we saw 250 hamstring injuries. So it's an, a unique environment to do your research and your clinical practice. And again, it all starts when they end our clinic with a national sports medicine program. So again, all the credits for the club doctors and the club physios. And our athletes are from all over the world. Most of them are from Northern Africa and the Middle East, but we can see them from Australia, the States, uh, up to South America. Let's start with the video and please have a look at the referee and tell me in 10 seconds what kind of injury he will have. Aguilis tendon? Looks like an Aguilis tendon. Somebody else? I'll show it a little bit. Start from the beginning? No, it's too difficult. But this is also one, it's all about history taking. I'll show you the complete video. Washburn, Titus, who runs it ahead. The TCU's going to take it. The putback for Washburn. Okay, Hemsley. So when a player enters Espeta or enters your clinic at, at the club, there are only four questions which are important. The first one, can I have my MRI? When? And normally they want to have an MRI even before they are injured. And the second question is, when can I play again? And that's the question you will have after one minute when they get injured. Then they will ask questions during the rehab. When can I safely return to play? And the fourth question, that's for the clever ones, they think about re-injuries. Let's focus on the first question. When can I get my MRI? And two years ago, when we looked in the literature, we looked at all the books that it was written. You have to do your MRI within 48 hours. Some others said, no, you can wait five days. And others said, no, we have to wait at least one day because the edema is increasing. And we didn't believe it. So we started a study. And all the credits for this study by the radiographers, uh, Salva and uh, with her team, and we had 15 players, they had an MRI within 24 hours, and then on each following day. And these are some examples. So this is day one, up till day seven, four players. And what you can see from this slide, edema is already present within the first 24 hours. And over the first week, it's almost equal. So there's no change over time when you look at edema uh, for hamstring injuries. And you can do it even on day one. Others would say, okay, but I'm not interested in edema. I want to see if there's fiber disruption. And this is the average, so the black one is the average length of fiber disruption. And what we can learn from this slide, yes, we can detect it already within 24 hours. So then you can already see the fiber disruption. And of course, it will be uh, the same over the complete period. So what we learned from this study, that yes, there's no difference over time, so we can do the MRI on day one, or we can wait even till day seven. So that really will help you when you have the discussion with the coach, 
what's the uh, best moment to do an MRI? You can say, okay, I can do it tomorrow, but we can also wait four or five days. We'll reduce the stress within your team. The second question is, that's the most important question always, when can I play? When can I return to play? And they will ask it just after the injury. And just before I came to Espital, we just did a uh, systematic review. And at that stage, we found out that there's no strong evidence for any MRI parameter. Please have a look at this slide. What do you remember from the previous slide? Bye-bye MRI. Do you remember more? When can I play? So bye-bye MRI, that's the, we stole it from uh, Dr. Popovich. But when we talk about MRI, also in this upcoming uh, 20 minutes, it's about predicting. So if you only remember this one, then you have got a, uh, my message is not clear. So it's about predicting, and here what's important, there's a question mark. So it's about by, by MRI for probably predicting return to play. And I'm gonna show you why. So when we are in the clinic, we try to grade our muscle injuries. So a grade one, this is a muscle injury with only edema, and there's no fiber disruption. The grade two, there's fiber disruption with edema, and these are the easy one for diagnosing, not for treating. These are the complete ruptures. As a sports medicine physician, 98% of the hamstrings we see are these cases. 2%, and these are the real difficult cases, will be seen by the orthopedic surgeon. And this can be career ending if they are not treated well. But we're gonna focus on the grade one. The grade one over here and the grade two over here. So in an ideal world, we will have our grade one with our own uh, return to play. So for example, return to play 70 days, and in an ideal world, we will have the grade two with another return to play. But in daily practice, this is what's gonna happen. So you've got your grade one, your grade two, and what you see, there's a wide overlap between grade one and grade two. What does it mean? That means when you've got a grade two injury, when they are over here, they can even return to play quicker than a grade one injury. So we've got some difficulties with grading these injuries. The second one we have, the problem, is the variance with in MRI grade. So this is an example of a grade two injury, a sprinting injury. And when we look in the literature, we know if you want to give a good prediction, you know some of them will return to play after two days. These might be the basketball players. And some, they will need 42 days. And then when you go to Mourinho, you will say, OK, coach, based on the best available evidence, I think he will return to play maybe in two days. It can take six weeks. Then you're fired, yeah? <laughs> but that is when you base your knowledge only on MRI. There's a wide variation. And I'm going to show you why. So here, something, yeah, there's the MRI. So this is a return to prediction model. So this is the MRI. We call it as the clinical predictors. And this is our enemy, the variance. So what will influence the return to play? The competition level, position he's playing, a full attacker will have probably a longer return to play than a very clever midfielder or a basketball player. External pressure, the coach, the family, it's all in our return to play. And all these things we will not see on MRI. So that's why there's a lot of variance in return to play with MRI. This is really, really new. And the last two years, there's a lot of attention to the intramuscular tendon injury. So this is the free tendon. This is the intramuscular tendon. And normally 98% is here at the muscular tendinous junction. But now we focus only on this tendon. And what we see in track and field is from uh, Britain. Normally, when this tendon is not uh, injured, the average return to play is 20 days. And in these track and field athletes, it's 60 days. So prolonged return to play. And look at this, recurrence rate, when it's not affected, it's 4%, and when it's injured, it's up to 60%.
It was repeated by Common, and now it's really hot, especially in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. We've got reviews on it, we've got editorials on it, so it's a real hype in sports medicine. But when you have a closer look at it, it's based on 27 cases. So 27 cases is now hot in uh, our literature. And what we also have to know, these 27 cases, the guy who uh, made return to play decision was fully informed about MRI. So we are not aware if they are treating the MRI or the patient. But if you use it, then we would say, okay, when the intramuscular tendon is ruptured or like here, fully ruptured or partially ruptured, we know from the literature it will take 18 days up to 128 days. And again, when you go back to Mourinho, you're fired. But please be aware, this is only based on 27 cases described. So this is fresh data. I arrived here on Sunday because of Saturday. I was not aware of National, uh, National Day. So I had time to have a look at our ESPTA data. Look over here, 32. So that's more than ever described in the, in the literature. And the good thing, in our study, we were blinded for the MRI. So this is a real unbiased uh, examination, evaluation. So we had 32 cases with a tendon lesion and 57 without an intramuscular tendon lesion. And what you see over here, return to place 23 days and 29. So that's completely different than um, the British, British uh, research, where it was up to 120 days. And then here you see we've got the same problem. Yes, you can have tendon involvement, but again, if you use it in daily clinical practice, some of them will have a quick return to play, and some of them can take up to 60 days. This was a lot of research, and, but within one hour we are back in the clinics, and we have to use what I just discussed. So, for example, if you have a walk-in clinic within 30 minutes, if somebody enters your clinic or you work at the club at 3 o'clock, somebody enters with a hamstring injury, before entering the clinic, you know the return to play of a hamstring injury can be one day, 45 days, in 95% of the case. So when somebody is entering, you already got a lot of information. And imagine you've got a crystal ball for predicting. So you got an MRI. That's the crystal ball. And you measure everything you got, grading, the extent of edema, the disruption, the location, the free tendon involvement, everything you get on MRI, you can measure, you put it in your model, and this is what's going to happen. Instead of one day, you can say, okay, maybe it's five days. Instead of 45 days, maybe it's 42 days. But still, in daily practice, I think we all got the feeling <coughs> that we really can predict. Hey, that's our feeling. It's in our hands. And it's really in our hands. Don't know this clever guy. But he did a real nice study with us. And this is back, 20 years back in history. And 20 years back, we didn't have MRI. We only had our hands, our ears, and talking to the patient. So we, when we only do history taking and physical examination on day one, what we normally do in clinical practice for more than 100 years, 200 years, and when we re-examine then after seven days, like we did in the days when we had no MRI, so just clinical practice, this is what's going to happen. Yeah, then you can say, okay, it can be two or three weeks. I think that reflects a little bit more what we also feel in daily practice. And that's we have proven, proven with research data from Espeta. So what's next? I was quite critical about MRI, but it's only for predicting, because MRI can be very, very useful for the diagnosis, for creating rest, because when you show pictures, you can work on your rehab. Everybody's happy. So MRI is a very, very important tool, but probably not for predicting. And for predicting, we have to look a little bit further, because at MRI, what do we see? We only see fluid. It's like here but we want to see what is below the fluid. So what are we are looking for? We are looking at muscle fascicles, but we can't see them with normal MRI. 
So now back in Holland, we are developing on an, uh, we are developing a new MRI technique. So this is the old one. And in the new one, we can track the fibers. So here you can see we can track the fibers, the muscle fibers, and when they are injured, we've got a pattern like this. And during recovery, it looks a little bit like this. And we can do it among the complete muscle. So we are working on it. For one patient, it now takes 20 hours to analyze one MRI. It's a lot of work. But we hope, and we also going to work with it here at Espata, I know there are some discussions going on, that we can reduce the time, and maybe this new MRI technique will be the solution for the upcoming years. But at this stage, I think MRI is useless for predicting return to play. And then we are a little bit closer to return to play, and then we have to make the right decision. I always mention that, okay, the first injury when they got injured is the problem of the coach. But the re-injuries, probably it's still the problem of the coach, but we get blamed for it. So we get blamed if there's a re-injury. So we have to develop some uh, reliable tools to make a good decision. We saw it always, you need a normalized muscle strength. And we also suggest, suggested that MRI might be useful for predicting uh, the good time for return to play. So this is the work we did over the last four years at ESPTA, because in the literature it was written, that's mentioned over here, that when you clear somebody for return to play, the isokinetic strength deficit should be less than 10%. So here we've got guys with more than 5%, and here up to 25%. And so we made a return to play decision without taking this in account. So we were unbiased. And what we found that when they returned to play, two out of three had an abnormal isokinetic testing. So they were back on the field, they were training, and two out of three had an abnormal isokinetic testing. And I think that really changed our clinical practice over here, that isokinetic testing is not part of the return to play decision protocol anymore. MRI might be useful, it was suggested in the literature, to guide your return to play. So this is the injury, a lot of edema, and here somebody is already back on the field. And 89%, up to 100% will have an abnormal MRI when you look at edema at return to play. So they can play a Champions League final with this MRI, so probably not that useful. Others would say, okay, I'm not interested in edema. I'm only interested if there's fibrosis, because fibrosis is always thought to be a risk factor for re-injury. So here we've got an injury, and here we've got some fibrosis. And so we merged the data from Espata and, uh, and here from, uh, from Holland, and we found out that 38 percent of the players will have fibrosis on MRI at return to play. But surprisingly, they had not an increased risk of re-injury. So we, yes, we can have fibrosis, but it will tell you absolutely nothing for predicting re-injuries. But we are still looking for a solution. Eh? So isokinetic, we can't use. What we are testing now is a Nord board, so it's also uh, strengths, but then eccentric strengths at return to play. And Rod and his team, they also use a new hamstring test from Askin described. If this test, when you quickly extend your, uh, your leg, if that is useful for making the right decision at return to play. But these were all measurements at return to play. And between injury and return to play, it's normally three or four weeks. So the key message is that we already start thinking before we are at that point of return to play. And I think that's the strength of the REA program they've got here at Espata. And there's a lot of information, but what we can learn from it, there are three stages inside and three stages on the field. And the strengths of this rehab program, there are a lot of criteria. So there, it's not focused on re criteria at return to play, but before you come at return to play, you already have to meet some strict criteria. 
So they start thinking already when the player is injured and when they progress through the rehab program. And what are the figures? With this program, the return to play is 22 till 25 days. Injury rate is 7%. But most important of this slide, you have to meet 11 criteria before you're at the point of return to play. So it's complete control rehab program. So is the one single examination which can guide return to play, at least it will not be MRI and it will not be isokinetic testing. So what's next? We are now working on a new program where we also include early lengthening exercises. Why? Or what are the exercises? This is the extender, so you extend your, your leg. This is the diver and the glider. And all these uh, exercises, they focus on lengthening your muscle. And why are we using that, introducing it? This is everything that is published about hamstring injuries. And here you see the return to play. This one, these two are data from Espata. This is Askling. He's the godfather of uh, hamstring injuries. And he published the best randomized controlled trial when you uh, focus on rehab programs. So this is our benchmark. And also have a look at this one. This is the UEFA study. That's our benchmark for comparing our data in professional football players. So this is Askling. And what you look, return to play. Hey, good. Espada is quicker than Askling. Almost comparable to the UEFA. So that's very good. A little quicker return to play. Then we look at the re-injuries. This is the wafer, 16% re-injuries in professional football. Esperta data, 7%. But what we see over here, Askling, and that is after he introduced his lengthening exercises, the re-injury rate is 0%. So we are focusing with a new rehab program to reduce especially the re-injury rate. I think the return to play, maybe we can fasten it a little bit, but m I think the focus is now on trying to reduce this re-injury rate, which is much, much lower than the benchmark, but we only go for the highest at 0%. <coughs> so this is an example which you can use in your rehab program to lengthen your muscle during a walking exercise. Can we have some uh, sound? Okay, good. So this is a new walking technique. How do we call this technique? Anybody? Does anybody know the name for this? Somebody from Scandinavia here on the Nordic countries? <laughs> uh, one guy there. Because when you're in Scandinavia now, I like, make a little bit of a joke about them. <laughs> the Nordics, they invented it in 2004, Iceland. When you look back, it was described in one of uh, already 200 years ago. 216 or maybe 2014, there was the Copenhagen adductor test. My grandma did it already the beginning of the previous century. <laughs> Alpha-some eccentric exercise therapy, described in 1998, was already 10 years before described by a, a group from the States. So now I'm looking for a good name for the new walking technique, this one. Any suggestions? <laughs> Andreas, Copenhagen test. Or was this already described before? You've seen this test before? Yes, it was described before, so we will not change the, the title of this one. The fourth question, I think that's an important one because that's we are blamed for. When is somebody at risk for a re-injury? And surprisingly, there were no data available in the, in the literature. So we started last year with analyzing our data, 
And what you see over here is the number of re-injuries uh, in percentage. So here, everybody is re-injured. So we looked in the guys who had a re-injury. And over here is the number of weeks between return to play and the re-injury. And what we can learn from this slide is that 50% got the re-injury within five weeks after return to play. So 50% within five weeks. And then we also had a look between the number of uh, days between initial injury and the re-injury. Again, here the percentage. And what we can learn from this slide is that 50% will have their re-injury within 50 days after initial injury. So after initial injury, 50 days you are at risk for re-injury. And then we had the question, okay, these are re-injuries within 50 days or within five weeks after return to play, but where are they located? Because re-injury is normally defined that it's in the same leg. So then we had a look if it's in the same leg but another muscle. So it can be in the biceps, the first injury, and the second injury in the uh, semitendinosus. Then it's yellow. It can be in the biceps, and the second injury can also be in the biceps, but then at a different location. Then it's green. Or it can be same location, same muscle. So exactly the same area of the biceps. So Emad analyzed all these uh, cases, and we found out that especially the early re-injuries are in exactly the same area as the index injury. So that might be incomplete healing or probably too much loading after return to play or a combination. So when we answer the final question, when I'm at risk of re-injury, 50 days after injury and without five weeks after return to play. And when you look at the literature, we can learn. So this is the level of evidence. So we summarized the complete literature and we found that there's no strong evidence for any parameter, but there's moderate evidence based on the current uh, literature that an intramuscular tendon injury is a risk factor for re-injury, but again, it's based on only 27 cases, patients, and probably when we add the data from ESPETA, we can delete this one. But at this stage, with the published data, intramuscular tendon injury might be a risk factor for re-injury. This one will always be a risk injury. So the biceps, when your biceps is injured, one out of five uh, in the big studies, one out of five will re-injury. So that's on the lateral side. When you've got an injury on the medial side, on the semi-tendinose or semi-membranose, the re-injury rate, rate is less than 3%. So if you've got a biceps, probably you have to be a little bit more careful. And if you've got a semi-injury, you can push them as hard as you want. Because the re-injury risk is very, very low in this group. So in summary, uh, when we summarize this talk, when can I get my MRI? The conclusion is based on the research we did here at ESPTA. Yes, you can do it on each day of the week. You can even start within 24 hours or wait seven days if you want to have less stress. When can I play again? What I showed you that you really can rely on your clinical examination. There's not one examination, but over time during the first week, at least one repeated clinical examination. And that's superior to MRI. The third question, I think there's a lot of work to do over there. When can I safely return to play? What we found out now that MRI is not that useful for that uh, decision, and that isokinetic strength deficits will persist even after returning to play. When are you at risk for a re-injury, especially during the first period after the injuries? 50 days after injury or five weeks after return to play, especially when it's in the biceps and probably also when the central tendon is disrupted. You all remember the first slide I showed you? The team from Kata. So what I try to uh, show you in this slide that we always have to go back to our history with the Copenhagen test and with the Nordic test. The solution is always in the history. And this team 
was 1981. This was the World Cup under 23 in Australia. Look at the teams. Big teams, and here's Qatar. Quarterfinals, Brazil, they beat it. They beat in England. Yeah, and what is normal in football, you play 11 and against 11, and at the end, the German will win. So <laughs> that was not that surprising. But to finalize, I want to show you a summary of that uh, World Cup. But I think that's part of the history here in Qatar we all have to know. It's in color, as you, you will see. I think this was in the first round against Poland. This is uh, against Brazil. Nice haircuts. Yeah, that's, I was really impressed when I found it out during this uh, last week. Thank you very much.